Welcome everyone, dear president, dear members of the jury, dear colleagues, dear friends and family. Thank you very much for joining me. Today I will present you my PhD thesis about numerical modeling of friction in lubricated coal trawling. I will start by introducing the topic and the objectives of this thesis before presenting my contributions. So let's start with the context. To produce cars or packaging like tin cans, very thick steel slabs have to be reduced in thickness. Initially, these slabs are hot rolled at about 1000 degrees Celsius since this temperature reduces the resistance of the material. Later on, when the strips become relatively thin, they are cold rolled at about 100 degrees Celsius to satisfy very strict geometrical tolerances without significant surface oxidation. This presentation is focused on cold rolling. Strips are cold rolled in primary tandem mills, which can be followed by secondary mills. A sheet tandem mill progressively reduces this thickness from several millimeters to several tenths of a millimeter. Such a mill is made up of four to six mill stands, which usually consist up of two backup rolls and two work rolls. The work rolls reduce the thickness of the strip by entraining the strip between them through their rotation and friction. <coughs> the contact region between the rolls and the strip is called the roll bite. So if T in is the entry thickness and T out the exit thickness, the reduction is defined as the difference between these thicknesses divided by the entry thickness. Due to the reduction in thickness in the roll bite and volume conservation, the speed of the strip increases along the rolling direction. A key parameter in cold rolling concerning this speed is the forward slip. It is defined as the relative exit speed of the strip with respect to the rolling speed. If the forward slip is negative, this means that the exit speed of the strip is smaller than the rolling speed. So in other words, friction is insufficient to entrain the strip and undesired skidding occurs. Cold rolling is conventionally lubricated and cooled by recirculating lubrication systems with an oil in water emulsion. Such systems are passive in the sense that the lubrication conditions like the oil concentration are not continuously adapted to control friction, uh, depending on uh, the rolling conditions. While the water in the emulsion cools the rolls and the strip, the oil is entrained into the roll bite because of its viscosity. Due to grinding of the rolls, they have a roughness with grooves along the rolling direction. For this reason, the contact conditions at the micro level are represented in an orthogonal plane to the rolling direction. In this plane, the relative contact area is defined as the ratio of the real contact area between solid surfaces and the apparent contact area. This is an, this is an important concept in this presentation. Due to the roughness, the forces between the rolls and the strip are partially supported by the solid and partially by the oil. Therefore, the interface pressure is equal to the weighted sum of the pressure on top of the asperities and the lubricant pressure. In a similar way, the interface shear stress is the weighted sum of the shear stress on top of the asperities and the lubricant shear stress. Since this interface shear stress represents the uh, friction component and since solid friction is generally much greater than viscous friction, overall friction is strongly dependent on the relative contact area and therefore on the lubrication. The interface shear stress applied to the strip can be represented as shown in this figure. So initially the rolling speed is greater than the strip speed and therefore the roll pushes the strip towards the neutral point where these speeds are equal. After the neutral point, the roll also pushes the strip towards the neutral point since its speed is lower than that of the strip. So if the interface shear stress increases due to friction, the horizontal compression of the strip increases. This implies that the vertical compression by the interface pressure has to increase to plastically deform the strip. In fact, this equation is the simplified von Mises yield criterion in which sigma y represents the yield stress. So if this yield stress is assumed to be constant and if sigma x decreases, pi has to increase. And if this vertical interface pressure increases, this implies that the rolling force, which pushes the rolls against the strip, increases. So in short, friction and the yield stress increase the rolling force. 
This leads us to the industrial problem. Because of growing concerns about climate change, the European Union enforces uh, reduction targets of CO2 emissions that have to be satisfied by car manufacturers. One way of reducing these CO2 emissions is to build lighter cars so that their fuel consumption can be reduced. To reduce the weight of cars while not compromising their safety, there is a great demand for harder and thinner sheet products by car manufacturers. As we've seen previously, increasing the hardness, this means the yield stress, increases the rolling force. This rolling force is however limited by the mill stand. So while this was no significant problem in the past, today advanced high strength steel strips are so hard that this force limit can be reached. So in other words, some products can simply not be produced. Previously, we have however also seen that friction increases the rolling force. So if friction was minimized for a given mill stand, while preventing skidding, harder and thinner products could actually be produced. Moreover, if friction was minimized, the energy consumption and roll wear could be reduced. To illustrate why friction control in cold rolling is especially crucial today, this figure shows the decrease of the rolling force when the effective coefficient of friction is decreased from uh, 0 0.05 to 0.04. So more precisely, Logier and colleagues computed this decrease by imposing a constant reduction for different entry thicknesses and different hardness grades. As you can see, the decrease becomes strongly dependent on friction when harder and thinner strips have to be produced. And this is exactly where the current production is heading to. So there is clearly a need for friction control in cold rolling. For the previous reasons, the flexible lubrication concept was developed by Logier and colleagues in the past. Unlike conventional lubrication systems, which are passive, as explained before, the flexible lubrication concept consists in continuously controlling friction by adjusting the lubrication conditions depending on the rolling conditions. One application of this concept, which was developed at ArcelorMittal uh, uh, is the addition of a flexible lubrication system to a conventional system as shown in this figure on the left. Unlike the conventional system, the flexible system is able to adjust the oil concentration in the emulsion by a static mixer so that friction can be controlled. Besides this effective control system, a predictive tool is required. This tool should be able to determine the optimal lubrication conditions like the oil concentration or its viscosity depending on the rolling conditions like the rolling speed or the product characteristics. For this reason, extensive research has been carried out in the past. Nonetheless, no complete predictive tool exists so far because some physical mechanisms cannot be modeled satisfactorily yet and because individual models of mechanisms could not be combined in one full model yet. Hence, the general objective is to accurately model friction in lubricated cold rolling to minimize friction while preventing skidding by flexible lubrication. In this thesis specifically, several intermediate targets were defined to converge towards this objective in the long run. The first intermediate target is to determine the most important physical mechanisms in cold rolling based on the most extensive experimental data available to include them afterwards in the model. Secondly, the most promising model so far, this means the MetaLoop model has to be rederived, documented, and extended to include the physical mechanisms that were determined previously. Based on the experimental data, the predictive capabilities of this model then have to be evaluated to uh, precisely determine its shortcomings. One of its shortcomings is missing MPH lubrication. This means microplast to hydrodynamic or hydrostatic lubrication, which I will explain uh, afterwards. Therefore, the Fourth objective is to introduce MPH lubrication by finite element simulations of asperity flattening in meter loop. Since these finite element simulations have their own shortcomings, the fifth objective is to explore modeling MPH lubrication by smooth particle hydrodynamics. So let's start with the experimental data. As I said, the objective was to determine the physical mechanisms to model and to have data to validate the model afterwards. The most comprehensive data that I could find were recorded by ArcelorMittal on a semi-industrial pilot mill, which is shown here on the right. 
these data were the most comprehensive data available for several reasons. First, they include roughness measurements of the strip and the rolls. Secondly, the thermopiezoviscous material laws of the lubricants were determined. This means their viscosity as a function of temperature and pressure. In addition, hardening laws of the strips were measured by plain strain compression tests, which are similar to cold rolling. And finally, what makes these data truly unique is the large design space that was studied. This means that the rolling forces and forward slips were measured for different rolling speeds, different roll products, different lubrication conditions, and different reductions. In particular, concerning the lubrication conditions, one should notice that a flexible lubrication system was available in addition to a conventional recirculating system. I post-processed the recorded data to build a library with 112 individual rolling scenarios. And I consider this library not only to be valuable within this thesis, but also in any future thesis concerning this specific topic to validate future extensions of the model. Then I analyzed the data to determine the physical mechanisms to model. In this presentation, I will only focus on the most important mechanisms within this scope. So the figures on this slide show the experimental variation of the rolling force and the forward slip as a function of the rolling speed in a test scenario with a lubrication by pure oil. As you can see, the values of the rolling force and the forward slip decrease with the rolling speed. This can be explained by the hydrodynamic effect. In fact, if the rolling speed increases, more oil is entrained into the roll by due to its viscosity. Therefore, the oil film thickness increases, which then reduces the relative contact area. And as we've seen previously, this implies that friction decreases so that the rolling force and the forward slip decrease. While the rolling force decreases in this case with the rolling speed, it increases for a different roll product. This increase can be explained by viscoplasticity. So more precisely, if the uh, rolling speed increases, the effective plastic strain rate increases, which then increases the yield stress. And as we've seen previously, the yield stress increases the rolling force. The forward slip, however, still decreases due to hydrodynamic lubrication. This specific test scenario is of importance since viscoplasticity has not been included so far in our rolling model, uh, which I will present later on. So up to now, the rolling speed and the roll product have been changed. One might now wonder what happens if the lubrication conditions are modified. So this plot shows again the rolling force as a function of the rolling speed. This time, however, for two different lubrication conditions. So in the first case, which we saw previously, 100%, this means pure oil is sprayed onto the strip by the flexible lubrication system. In the second case, an emulsion with 2% oil is sprayed onto the strip by the recirculating system. The increase of the rolling force at higher rolling speeds when the oil concentration decreases can be explained by starvation. In fact, if less oil is provided to the roll bite by the lubrication system than the roll bite can absorb, the oil film thickness in the roll bite decreases. Hence, the relative contact area increases and friction increases. As we've seen previously, this increases the rolling force and the forward slip. It is important to mention that this is only possible in the domain of starvation. More precisely, as shown in uh, figures A and B, if less oil is provided to the roll bite, then it can absorb. And if even less oil is provided, the oil film thickness in the roll bite decreases. If, however, as shown in figures C and D, much more oil is provided to the roll bite, then it can absorb. And if the provided oil quantity is only slightly reduced, the film thickness in the roll bite is unchanged. In this case, it is equal to the maximum film thickness in full fluted lubrication. This means abundant lubrication by pure oil. This is actually what happens at rolling speeds below 100 meters per minute in the figure on the left, since the roll bite does not absorb a lot of oil at low rolling speeds. Hence, the um, oil film thickness in the roll bite is essentially identical for both lubrication systems and therefore the rolling forces too. <laughs> 
It is important to mention that friction control by flexible lubrication is based on starvation. As you can see here in this figure, friction and thus the rolling force and the forward slip are controlled by the oil concentration in the emulsion. If this concentration increases, the rolling force and the forward slip are reduced. So now we have talked about the influences of the rolling speed, the rolled product, and the lubrication conditions. An additional influence is the influence of the reduction. Therefore, the rolling force and the forward slip are now represented as a function of the reduction. Their increases can be explained by the changing geometry in the roll bite, among other effects. In particular, the forward slip was expected to increase due to more severe friction conditions when the reduction increases. It might, however, also decrease. And this can be explained by MPH lubrication. This means microplastohydrodynamic or hydrostatic lubrication, which I mentioned in the introduction, but which I did not explain so far. So let's take a closer look to what might happen in the roll bite. So at the entry of the roll bite, the roll and the strip are not in contact. Then further in the roll bite, the asperities of the roll indent the strip and they break the lubricant film. Even further in the roll bite, some lubricant might get trapped in surface pockets, which are progressively pressurized. At some point, the lubricant pressure becomes so significant that the lubricant permeates into the solid contact zone so that the relative contact area decreases. The decrease of the forward slip with the reduction can be explained in a similar way. In fact, if the reduction increases, the pressurization of the lubricant increases so that more and more lubricant might permeate into the solid contact zone, which decreases the relative contact area. And as we've seen previously, this reduces friction and therefore the rolling force and the forward slip. Like viscoplasticity, the identification of this effect is important since our rolling model meta loop, which I will introduce later on, does not yet include MPH lubrication. So, in this section, I identified several interacting mechanisms that should be included in the model, and in particular viscoplasticity and MPH lubrication, since these mechanisms are not yet included in our rolling model. In addition, post, uh, in addition I post-processed the data to validate the model afterwards. Therefore, the next step is to build the model. So, as expected, such a complex problem cannot be solved by a single equation. Therefore, highly specialized modeling codes, in particular MetaLoop, were developed in our research group based on Marceau's lam 2 d Trivo model. The problem with these codes was that different versions existed due to progressive improvements with, without a consistent and detailed documentation. Hence, it was unclear which specific system of equation was implemented and how some of these equations were derived. This made it virtually impossible to extend the model. In addition, some physical mechanisms were not yet included, as mentioned previously. Thus, to build a strong foundation, I decided to rederive the full meta loop model and to document it before trying to extend it. In the following slides, I will focus on the main features of the model, and those uh, that I added will be written in blue. So meta loop is based on the slab method in which the internal stresses of the strip only change along the rolling direction. Moreover, the internal shear stresses are neglected. Hence, the remaining principal stresses can be computed by writing the equilibrium equations of one slice of the strip. The internal stresses are then related uh, to the strains by the material law of the strip. The latest meta loop version could, however, only model elastoplastic deformations. Previously, we have however seen that viscoplasticity increases the rolling force when the rolling speed increases in some cases. For this reason, I added the possibility to include, uh, to, to include the effective plastic strain rate in the computation of the yield stress. Moreover, the measured yield stress was usually decreased by hand in the past to reproduce experimental results probably because thermal softening was not included in the model. So for this reason, I also added a thermoplasticity model to MetaLoop by including the strip temperature in the computation of the heel stress. I will later explain um, how this temperature is computed. 
Hence, Metalube is now able to model elastic thermal viscoplastic deformations of the strip by material laws like this Johnson Cook model. The next point is roll flattening. As shown in this figure here on the left, the roll can be flattened by large interface stresses. For this reason, various models were added to Metaloop to compute the roll profile in the past. In my PhD thesis, I added Minder's extension of Jordan's method so that not only radial displacements of the profile are computed, but also tangential displacements due to local interface pressures and shear stresses. At the micro level, one distinguishes the mean line of the asperity profile in green and the mean line of this asperity profile after its flattening by the roll in red. Hence, the distances h and ht can be defined. The mean film thickness ht can then be related to the strip thickness and uh, the roll profile. It is important to mention that ht is used in this relation instead of h in the past, which seems more consistent now and which will or which is required when asperity flattening is computed by the finite element method later on in this presentation. So in classical meta loop computations, asperity flattening is computed by analytical models. This means that the relative contact area is computed by an equation of the pressure on top of the asperities the lubricant pressure and the plastic strain rate of the strip along the rolling direction. The analytical flattening models in Metaloop are those by Wilson and Scheu, Marceau and Sutcliffe, and I added an additional model, which is the model by Sutcliffe based on uh, Corsequa and Ali's or colleagues' results. As in the past, the lubricant pressure is computed by the average Reynolds equation with flow factors to take into account the roughness. And I corrected some of these flow factors, which did, however, not significantly impact the results. The lubricant shear stress is computed by the product of the viscosity and the speed differential between the roll and the strip, which is divided by the mean film thickness in the valleys. And I also added the shear stress factor approach by Patia and Cheng which was, however, not extended to large relative contact areas. Concerning the thermal model, the coupling between the finite volume uh, solver term roll and Stephanie's version of Metaloop had unfortunately been abandoned because of its programming style. To have, however, a prediction of the strip temperature and the lubricant temperature, I included uh, various simplified models. So the strip temperature is computed by an adiabatic model, which includes heating by the plastic deformation and friction. And the lubricant temperature can either be constant, be computed by the strip temperature, or by heating due to friction. Finally, all the previous equations and many more are combined to write systems of the equations for the different zones in the roll bite. More precisely, the roll bite is divided into zones depending on the contact status between the roll and the strip, the deformation mode, elastic or elastoplastic, and the high-speed hypothesis. Because of these uh, differences between zones, different systems of equations were derived for the different zones. So initially, when there is no contact, one is in the hydrodynamic inlet zone. Later on, when the contact or when, when the first contact occurs, one transitions to the mixed inlet zone, which continues until the yield stress is reached. At this point starts the low speed work zone. In this work zone, the lubricant pressure can either remain smaller than the interface pressure or it can uh, reach the interface pressure. So if the lubricant pressure remains smaller than the interface pressure, one remains in this low speed work zone until the strip becomes elastic again, in which case one transitions to the low speed outlet zone. Now, if the lubricant pressure, however, reaches the interface pressure, additional zones, this means different systems of the equations, were added to prevent this pressure from becoming greater than the interface pressure. In this zone, or in, uh, yeah, in these zones, the lubricant pressure is imposed to be equal to the interface pressure. And I added this last transition uh, for the previous reason. As I said before, each zone has its own system of equations. So for instance, the uh, system on this slide is a short version of the system in the low speed work zone. 
As you can see, it is very easy to lose the overview so that extending the model becomes quite difficult. For this reason, I worked a lot on trying to document all underlying equations of the model as carefully as possible, while also unifying systems of equations to keep the model as concise as possible. Concerning this unification, you can see, for instance, that the system can model a roll byte with or without lubricant by either computing the lubricant pressure by the Reynolds equation or by setting the lubricant gradient to zero. Similarly, the relative contact area can either be computed without the coupling, this means by the analytic, uh, analytical asperity flattening equation, or by the uh, coupling procedure that I will present later on. The general meter loop algorithm finally takes the form of this flow diagram with four nested adjustment loops. So more precisely, for a roll profile, for a position of the roll axis, for a strip speed, and for a lubricant flow rate, the previous systems of equations are integrated explicitly from one zone to the next until the end of the roll byte. The lubricant flow rate is then adjusted until the lubricant pressure at the end of the roll byte is zero. The strip speed is adjusted, is adjusted until the um, front tension is reached. The position of the roll axis is shifted until the final strip thickness is reached. And finally, the roll profile is adjusted until it corresponds to the stresses that it is subjected to. Concerning this algorithm, you have to know that convergence is not always straightforward in MetaLoop because of numerous uh, different components in the model. This is especially problematic when MetaLoop will be coupled with a different solver in a following section of this presentation. So I spent literally months uh, debugging the model. In particular, I improved the robustness by removing unnecessary convergence criteria and by choosing initial conditions closer to the final solution. Besides rederiving, documenting, and extending the model, I completely refactored its implementation by my former colleague Yves Carita. Hence, MetaLoop is implemented in object oriented C with a Python interface to define data sets and a graphical user interface in PyQt. This means that MetaLoop is not a MATLAB code that disappears after the thesis, but it is a real research and industrial software solution with state of the art design choices. The figures on this slide show a Python data set on the left and the graphical user interface. So currently, the core functionalities of MetaLoop are implemented on 21,000 C++ lines, and in addition, more than 200 tests are run before any software modification to prevent any regressions. In particular, I worked a lot on improving the robustness of the software and its coding style to facilitate its development in the long run. So now, after talking a lot about this model, it is about time to evaluate its predictive capabilities and shortcomings. Like any numerical model, MetaLoop contains numerical parameters, like integration steps or convergence tolerances. In the past, the model contained so many parameters that their calibration was essentially only possible by trial and error. I improved this situation by reducing the number of parameters, which can be seen here on the left, uh, for each layer of the MetaLoop algorithm. And I calibrated these parameters systematically for the first time to have a numerical error estimation to reduce the computation time and to prevent any non-convergence. This last point is especially important due to the nested loop structure of MetaLoop. This means that if numerical parameters of an inner adjustment loop like the integration steps delta x are not strict enough with respect to tolerances of an outer loop like this tolerance of the front tension, the uh, convergence is not always possible. This is illustrated here on the right by showing uh, the iterative adjustments of the strip speed to reach the imposed front tension. And as you can see, it might be impossible for the prediction, this means uh, these dots, to fall into the tolerance interval if, for instance, the integration steps are not small enough. So after calibrating the numerical tolerances, I try to evaluate the predictive capabilities of the model based on the data that we've seen previously. 
So here in these figures, the rolling force and the forward slip are again shown as a function of the rolling speed. The blue curves are the experimental results, the green curves are the old predictions, and the red curves are the new predictions. And as you can see, there is an overall improvement of the old predictions and especially of the forward slip. To obtain these results, the boundary, co uh, the, uh, boundary coefficient of friction was adjusted as in the past. And instead of adjusting the yield stress due to thermal softening, the thermoplasticity coefficient was adjusted. Moreover, the lubricant temperature at the entry of the roll bite was assumed to be constant, and the lubricant shear stress was neglected in the roll bite by assuming that the viscosity becomes very small due to heating by friction between the rolls and the strip. So there's clearly room for improvement by a more accurate temperature prediction of the lubricant in the future. The next rolling scenario is the one with starvation. There is again an overall improvement by the new predictions in red. And as you can see in the uh, top right corner, starvation is modeled in meter loop by assuming that the lubricant pressure only starts to increase when the distance between the roll and the strip becomes smaller than the lubricant film thickness at the entry of the roll pipe. Since this thickness is computed in the model, or is, uh, is not computed in the model rather, but manually adjusted, a film formation model should be added to MetaLoop in the future. So previously we saw that the rolling force can also increase with the rolling speed due to viscoplasticity. After the implementation of viscoplasticity, you can see in this figure that the new predictions in red are significantly better to the uh, old predictions than the old predictions, I mean. These old predictions were actually obtained by assuming that the underlying physical mechanism is starvation, which seems, however, inconsistent considering that a pure oil was sprayed onto the strip in this test. The shortcoming of the model in terms of its predictive ability is that the viscoplasticity coefficient, like the thermoplasticity coefficient before, was not experimentally identified but adjusted. Finally, the rolling force and the forward slip can also be predicted as a function of the thickness reduction instead of the rolling speed. In this case, there existed no old prediction, but as you can see in green, MetaLoop predicts the experimental results relatively well. The prediction can, however, be improved by decreasing the boundary, co uh, the boundary coefficient of friction with the reduction. So as shown in the uh, top right corner, this boundary coefficient of friction is used in the computation of the shear stress on top of the asperities. Hence, the improvement by the reduction of this coefficient with the reduction suggests that a physical mechanism is missing in the model. And this mechanism might be microplastohydrodynamic or hydrostatic lubrication. The influence of this mechanism is even more important in uh, this second rolling scenario that I showed you previously, so that there is clearly a need for modeling MPH lubrication in MetaLoop. This brings us to the fifth section of this presentation about finite element disparity flattening in MetaLoop. So conventionally, the relative contact area, the pressure in the solid contact zone, the lubricant pressure, and the plastic strain rate along the rolling direction are related by analytical asperity flattening equations in MetaLoop. For instance, the equation on this slide is the asperity flattening equation by Wilson and Schur. These analytical equations, however, have some limitations. So first, they were derived by simplified geometries like flat indentus in the example. Secondly, they were derived by simplified material laws like a rigid, perfectly plastic material. Thirdly, they were derived by approximate methods like the upper bound method in the case of Wilson and Schur. And finally, these models do not take into account MPH lubrication. Therefore, the next objective is to introduce an enhanced finite element disparity flattening model with MPH lubrication in MetaLoop. My former colleague Yves Carreta had already been working on this problem in the past. In fact, he developed the first finite element model capable of simulating MPH lubrication, however, in plain strip drawing and not in cold drawing. In this model, strip drawing is simulated with a macroscopic lubricant pocket in our in-house finite element solver, Metaphor. Uh, 
In particular, the lubricant flow is simulated by the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian formulation. In this way, the material flow is uncoupled from the mesh to prevent mesh distortions. Since the lubricant can, however, only flow inside of the mesh, artificial lubricant pipes had to be added to the model so that the lubricant could permeate into the solid-solid contact zone. To adapt this model to cold trawling so that MPH lubrication can be simulated in cold trawling, Carreta later developed a coupling procedure between MetaLube and MetaFor. In this coupling procedure, asperity flattening was simulated by the uh, finite element method similar to um, the lubricant pocket in the strip drawing previously. Hence, lubricant pipes were added again by a shifted contact tool so that the pressure increase in the valleys could open these pipes and then decrease the solid contact zone like in MPH lubrication. Carreta's coupling procedure, however, only uh, converged if the lubricant pressure was not updated based on the finite element results. Hence, this convergence was actually no real convergence since the influence of the finite element model on the uh, lubricant pressure was not considered. So because Carreta's coupling procedure did not converge, I developed a simplified procedure to better understand how MetaLube could be coupled with Meta4 to simulate MPH lubrication in the long run. In this coupling procedure, the micromodel of asperity flattening is defined as follows. So first, the strip portion is pushed against a rigid fixed contact tool which represents the roll by the interface pressure. As usually assumed in cold rolling, the strip cannot deform laterally. Moreover, the model is defined in a generalized plane strain state, which means that the model is defined in 2D, but by taking the out-of-plane elongation of the strip due to rolling into account. The out-of-plane lengths, as well as the interface pressure, are computed by MetaLoop. Finally, the lubricant pressure is applied where the uh, roll is not in contact with the strip. This finite element micromodel can then be plugged into the full coupling procedure, which is shown on this slide. So this procedure starts by a classical full meter loop computation with the analytical asperity flattening equation. In this computation, the interface pressure, the strip elongation, and the lubricant pressure are computed along the roll bar. These functions of space are then transformed into functions of time, which are applied in the micro model. Depending on the pressures and the elongations of the strip, the finite element model then computes the relative contact area and the mean film thickness. These evolutions are then used in the coupled version of the meta loop model instead of the results of the analytical asperity flattening equation. To propagate the influence of the new finite element model uh, or flattening model in the solution, this process is then continued with relaxations for several iterations. So after this definition of the model, we can take a look at some numerical results to illustrate this procedure. So these results are based on an experimental scenario of the data that I uh, presented previously. In this scenario, the roll is much rougher than the strip. Therefore, the roll is assumed to have a triangular asperity profile while the strip is smooth. And only the red part is simulated due to symmetry. So before playing this animation, notice that the inputs of the micro model, this means the interface pressure and the lubricant pressure along the right, will be shown in this top right corner while the output, this means the relative contact area, is shown in the bottom right corner. So initially you will see the uh, contact forces rising in the solid contact region before the lubricant pressure increases where no solid contact exists. So let's take a look at this. So initially the solid contact forces increase and then the lubricant pressure increases. This explains the existence of this bump of the relative contact area. And finally, the relative contact area becomes constant because the lubricant pressure becomes equal to the interface pressure. The full coupling procedure did, however, not converge immediately, and it had several shortcomings. I will only briefly explain them since they are very subtle. So first, the results of the finite element model were mesh dependent when the lubricant pressure became equal to the interface pressure. This is shown here on the left. 
As you can see, there are different relative contact areas along the roll byte when the number of elements along the top edge of the strip portion is increased. A tentative solution to this problem was to slightly reduce the lubricant pressure so that it would not become equal to the interface pressure. And as you can see in this uh, figure on the right, this solved actually the mesh dependence problem. Secondly, a necessary condition for convergence was not satisfied. In fact, the results of the uh, coupled meter loop computation based on the relative contact area and the mean film thickness from the classical meter loop computation were different from the results of this classical computation. These results should, however, be uh, equal since the flattening model is still the same in both models. So this problem was tentatively solved by introducing a different criterion in the adjustment loop of the lubricant flow rate. So finally, after the previous uh, improvements, the procedure converged relatively smoothly in general, as you can see here on the left, where the uh, convergence history of the rolling forces is represented for different rolling speeds. The results of the coupling procedure in red, here on the right, can then be compared to the experimental data in blue and the results of the classical computation in green. One notices that the uh, rolling forces of the classical meter loop model in green are greater than those of the coupling procedure in red. This can be explained by an increase of friction, which is due to an increase of the relative contact area. So in other words, Wilson ensures equation seems to overestimate the relative contact area. These results should, however, not be overrated due to the strong hypotheses that were required to reach the convergence. These hypotheses could possibly uh, be removed by a solution that seems very computation intensive, but even then the model would still not include MPH lubrication. So for this reason, I decided to come back to the uh, initial topic of my PhD, this means SPH simulations of asperity flattening to model MPH lubrication. As I said before, the most promising model of MPH lubrication so far seems to be Caretta's finite element model of plane strip drawing. This model has, however, several limitations. So first, artificial lubricant pipes are required to allow permeation since the lubricant can only flow within the finite element mesh. Secondly, large deformations are limited by mesh distortions, as illustrated uh, here on the right. In fact, during asperity flattening, the red element becomes so distorted that the computation is stopped. Thirdly, Caretta's model has a long computation time of about 10 days. And finally, it is a 2D model whose extension to uh, 3D is probably not as straightforward as the method that I will present hereafter. Hence, the last objective of my PhD was to explore the smooth particle hydrodynamics method to model MPH lubrication. But why did I choose this method? Well, the discretization of a continuum by a mesh can either be Eulerian, Lagrangian, or arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian in the finite element method. If the mesh is Eulerian, it is fixed in space so that there are no mesh distortions but it is difficult to track the boundary or uh, yeah, the boundary of the continuum or history dependent material properties. If the formulation is Lagrangian, mesh distortions can appear since the nodes of the mesh correspond to material points of the continuum. Boundary tracking is however automatic. Finally, the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian formulation solves the previous weaknesses, but the mesh motion has to be anticipated since the continuum can only move within the mesh. So for instance, uh, previously the artificial lubricant pipes had to be introduced. So if the mesh was replaced by Lagrangian particles, the previous weaknesses could be solved. So SPH was selected since it is the most well-known Lagrangian meshless particle method. SPH is based on two approximations mainly the kernel approximation and the particle approximation. On the one hand, the kernel approximation is based on writing a function f of space, like uh, the pressure field, as its convolution by the direct delta function. This direct function is then approximated by a kernel function. 
This kernel is bell-shaped and it has a finite support. This support is defined by its smoothing length, which is shown here in 2D. This means that it is zero or that this kernel function is zero outside of this domain. On the other hand, the particle approximation consists in replacing the integral by the sum over the particles within the support domain of the kernel function. This has the advantage that the gradient of the function can be evaluated by the gradient of the kernel function. This approximation of the gradient of f is, however, not even zero order complete. This means that it cannot uh, approximate correctly the gradient of a constant function. To correct this shortcoming, this uh, difference in blue is introduced in the gradient approximation. Moreover, first order completeness can be restored by a normalization operation through the shape matrix K. So numerous SPH formulations exist in the literature, and I decided to use uh, Eulerian SPH, which, which uh, others call updated Lagrangian SPH for fluids, and total Lagrangian SPH for solids. The equations here on the left are the uh, conservation equations of linear momentum. They were partially derived by a variational principle by Bonnet and Locke to have a linear and angular momentum preserving properties. Concerning uh, fluids, it is possible to include nonlinear compressibility and Newtonian viscosity in the computation of the Cauchy stresses. Moreover, the artificial Monaghan viscosity was added for stability reasons. Concerning solids, total Lagrangian SPH was used to prevent the tensile instability in SPH. In fact, as you can see uh, in this second equation, the first piola kirchhoff stresses P are integrated in the reference configuration. The values of these stresses are computed by ELAS to J2 plasticity with hardening based on a corrotational formulation and the radial return algorithm. Moreover, due to the possible existence of zero energy modes in SPH, a zero energy mode suppression algorithm similar to Flanagan and Belichko's anti-hourglassing method was also applied. Finally, a simple penalty force was used to compute the contact interaction, either between solids or between solids and fluids. This specific SPH formulation was implemented by Georg Gansenmüller in the user SMD package of LAMPS, which is the molecular dynamic solver developed by Sandia National Laboratories. And I made some uh, small modifications to this source code, like changing the uh, kernel function and adding some post-processing features. The strong point of LAMPS is its computational efficiency. So first, in our case, neighbor searches have linear scalability due to uh, link cell binning and neighbor lists. And secondly, parallelization is implemented by domain decomposition with dynamic load balancing. This means that computations are not only parallelized, but that the workload is also evenly shared between computing cores. I consider these features to be absolutely necessary to solve industrial problems by particle methods. Finally, it is worth mentioning that the equations are explicitly time integrated by the uh, velocity valet algorithm so that a time step stability limit has to be satisfied. To better understand this specific SPH formulation and its implementation, I created the first fluid and fluid uh, structure interaction validation tests of the user SMD package. These tests were selected based on those that my uh, former colleague, Marco Lucio Cercaglia, chose to validate his PFAM and coupling codes. So in this presentation, I will only show a selection of my SPH results. So the first test here on this slide is water sloshing in an oscillating reservoir. In this test, the water flow and the water pressure at the pressure sensor are recorded when the reservoir is tilted. So I will first show you the water flow here on the right. So the real water is yellow green and the superimposed prediction is red. So as you can see, uh, the prediction of the free surface is very accurate. The prediction of the 
pressure is satisfying, but it could certainly be improved by introducing a more sophisticated boundary condition than the penalty force. So next, I simulated fluid structure interaction by the uh, dump brake against an elastic obstacle. The first figure uh, gives an idea about the dimensions in this problem. So one should notice that the obstacle is very flexible with a Young's modulus of only one megapascal. The figure on the right is an animation which shows the bending of the obstacle, uh, which I will show you right now. So there you can see the bending of the obstacle and the returning weight. The horizontal displacement of the top corner of the obstacle can be represented as a function of time, which is shown here on the left. And as you can see, my results in purple are close to those obtained by different methods and uh, by different authors too. Finally, I wanted to test whether the SPH code could reproduce a test scenario with Newtonian viscosity so that MPH lubrication could be modeled in the long run. Therefore, I simulated the viscous flow between fixed walls due to gravity. So in this simulation, particles leaving the domain by the bottom are re-injected at its top by a periodic boundary condition. To introduce a non-slip boundary condition between the walls and the fluid, the boundary was defined by some layers of ordinary fluid particles whose velocity was set to zero. These particles were then included in the particle approximation of moving fluid particles to slow them down by Newtonian viscosity. The figure here on the right shows the displacement of the fluid along the pipe at different moments in time. The lines represent the experimental, uh, the analytical solution, while the uh, circles are the SPH solution. And as you can see, particles uh, at the boundary are slowed down as expected. Improvements are, however, still possible by uh, decreasing the particle spacing or by a more sophisticated boundary. Uh, condition. So after these general validation tests, I focused on asperity flattening and I chose the problem statement by Schwarz and Jastrebov since they provide some reference solutions in specific cases. So in this problem statement, elastic perfectly plastic steel with a wavy surface is pushed against a rigid horizontal plane. The surface pockets between the steel and the plane are partially filled by a non-linearly compressible oil, and I wanted to compute the relative contact area as a function of the interface pressure that pushes the strip against the plane. So to solve this problem, I followed a progressive resolution strategy. First, I studied the compression of an elastoplastic solid, then dry asperity flattening, and afterwards the compression of a fluid, and finally lubricated asperity flattening. So in this presentation, I will only focus on dry and lubricated disparity flattening though. Due to the periodicity of the geometry, the compression of the solid with a single pocket is simulated by preventing the horizontal displacement of the vertical edges. The compression is then achieved by imposing the upward speed of the bottom edge. The discretization of this problem is illustrated with the contact cir circles here in the uh, top left corner. Although boundary tracking is automatic in SPH, you can see that the boundary is less well discretized by particles than by Lagrangian meshes so far. And since I used a uniform particle distribution, I had to increase the amplitude of the asperity to 20 microns instead of 2 micrometers to not unnecessarily need millions of particles to discretize the asperity profile. In my computation, I used uh, 36,000 particles, and the computation time was about 4.5 hours on 12 cores. This performance can obviously be improved by locally refining or coarsening the discretization in the future. The relative contact area is computed by the uh, contact status of the particles of the uh, rigid horizontal plane as illustrated here in the uh, figure in the top right corner. So let's take a look at the results. As you can see, 
uh, full contact is reached by SPH. This is also shown uh, below. Full contact was, however, not possible in an equivalent finite element simulation due to mesh distortions. And finally, I will show you the first SPH simulation of lubricated asperity flattening. This simulation is essentially identical to the previous configuration, but, but with oil uh, this time. In this uh, figure on the right, I plotted the relative contact area as a function of the interface pressure, either by the finite element model without oil or by the SPH model with oil. And as you can see, the results are essentially identical as long as the oil is not compressed. At low pressure, a small difference exists because the particles approximate less accurately the geometry than the mesh. And later on, when the uh, lubricant is compressed, hydrostatic lubrication decelerates the increase of the solid contact area. So finally, let's take a look at what happens at the micro scale. So first the asperities are flattened, then the oil is compressed, later on it seems to infiltrate into the solid, and finally artificial permeation occurs. The Infiltration seems to be due to the uh, penalty contact, which can probably be solved by the boundary condition by Adami and colleagues. And the artificial permeation only occurs at very high pressures, which will probably not be reached in cold rolling. Hence, this simulation can be considered to be the first successful, successful simulation of lubricated asperity flattening by SPH. One might finally wonder whether MPH lubrication can be simulated by SPH. And the answer is not yet. In fact, the method is able to simulate very complex problems, but further developments are still required to solve its current shortcomings. This means the uh, penalty boundary condition, as I explained previously, and the computation time when the particle size decreases. So in conclusion, I post-processed and analyzed the most comprehensive available experimental data of lubricated cold rolling. Based on these data, I re-derived, documented, extended, and refactored the MetaLoot model and its implementation. Due to its numerous features and state-of-the-art implementation, it is one of the most powerful models of lubricated cold rolling on the planet. Later on, I evaluated MetaLoop's predictive capabilities based on the previous data. Thus, all predictions were improved by this model, uh, which, however, has still some uh, shortcomings like missing MPH lubrication. For this reason, the first coupling procedures between MetaLoop and finite element models of lubricated asperity flattening, including the strip elongation, were developed. Their convergence was, however, uh, linked to strong hypotheses, so that I continued my research by exploring an alternative simulation method. Hence, I simulated complex validation tests of fluid structure interaction for the first time by the LAMPS use SMD code. And finally, I created the first SPH models of dry and lubricated asperity flattening. Concerning the outlook, I suggest several future research perspectives in my thesis with precise steps about their implementation and with complementary references. First, a full thermal model like Termrol should be incorporated into the MetaLoop software project to have a prediction of the lubricant temperature, which is missing so far. Secondly, instead of trying to couple very complex codes like MetaLoop and Meta4, I suggest an analytical MPH lubrication model in my thesis based on the work by Ahmed and Sutli. By this model, the relative contact area would be decreased in MetaLoop as a function of variables that favor MPH lubrication so that friction is reduced by this lubrication mechanism. Thirdly, a lubricant film formation model like Casarini's model should be coupled with MetaLoop to predict the film thickness at the entry of the byte. Then, the extension of experimental data could eliminate modeling uncertainties like the viscoplasticity coefficient. And finally, the computation time of SPH simulations could be decreased by refinements of the discretization while Adami's boundary condition could solve the infiltration problem. 
This SPH model could then serve as a complementary model to the analytical MPH model in MetaLoop. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.